What happens when a blind man, a woman of color, and a child of immigrants get together to discuss how diversity, inclusion, and equity affect your business? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Choose Inclusion podcast. I'm UB, and I am the Latino white guy of the group. I'm Nina. I am the woman of color in the group. And I'm Mike. I'm uh, the blind guy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Choose Inclusion podcast. This is UB. I'm here with Mike and Nina, as always. And by the way, um, for this particular recording, today, April 1st, is Mike's birthday. Happy birthday, Mike. Happy birthday, Mike. Thanks, Happy guys. birthday, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. All right. Everybody's saying, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll record a separate one for that. <laughs> well, we're excited because we've got uh, Craig Foreman. He's the senior people scientist at CultureAmp on the show today. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful because Craig and I connected right before COVID-19 took the world by storm. And I've, I'm thankful because of the resources and support that an organization like CultureAmp provides, particularly in this kind of situation. And so what we're going to talk about today is, you know, managing culture in a time of crisis. Um, but first, Craig, thank you. Welcome to the show. Um, what, it, what does it mean to be the senior people scientist? Let's start there. And you're on mute, I think. And there I am. Okay. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for awesome. having me and, and asking me to do this. I'm, I'm honored and just it's getting to know all of you has been a real treat and to be part is, is awesome. What is a lead? Okay. For, um, so my title is senior, which has changed lead people scientist. But the, but the, the, the truth is, uh, aside from that, what does that mean at, at culture am look I, at a high level we built, I'm really proud of this company on many levels and the CEO Didier Elzinga, um, we're based out of, of Australia wanted early on to embed modern organizational psychology in everything that we do. And he didn't want um, just to have one or two token IO psychologists that worked on the survey. And, you know, he really wanted to, to walk that walk. So we built a team, which became the people science team. And currently we have about 20 people globally. And everybody on the team has a master's or PhD in IO psychology. Um, and that team is then distributed out through the organization. So we, we have what we call practice, which is, is, that, is that team. Um, and then uh, we sit in different ways. So we do have some people that sit working on our prob product. And we do have some people that work internally to help us run our, our, our organization and run our surveys. Many of the people scientists are client facing. So they're supporting our client facing teams with content for our, for our partners or getting involved in helping some of our you know, clients design their surveys and think about why they're designing the surveys the way they are and what can they tweak or modify. Um, and then doing like results calls. So supporting organizations with understanding how to use the tools and extract stories. Um, that's kind of the high level. I have drifted in my work into marketing. Um, so I started, I spent the first year and a half working with our clients. Um, and then we started doing our global conferences. I, just because I was following my passion, I, I got involved in that and I was helping build our, our Culture First Global Conferences and we started doing um, some other conferences for, for leaders or Culture First Forums and I was building those and um, kind of then became more of a, a community builder and, and now I'm fully right now focused on building, we're looking to build the world's largest community of people who are focused on, on a better world of work and, and taking action to make that happen. Um, so that's a long answer to what a people science person does. So I think I, but like there's the context of it and then how the different ones are showing up or different Trump different ways, but that's kind of what I'm bringing to, to the table for culture. Amp. Well, and it, yeah, that's awesome. And it, we align on so many of those because um, it, it, particularly the, the building this com global community to, to build a better place of work, you know, that collective impact strategy is something that we've always um, internalized both the Jobber group and breaking the bias, but just th this group, you know, Nina and Mike, myself, really focused on coming together, right? Three different people, three different organizations, but similar passion and mindset. And I know I can't do it all myself. So why wouldn't I partner with these, these key people to, to make it happen? And that, that's what I love about the Culture First um, initiative that, that, that you've launched this year, which is just really exciting. What, I mean, what 
has anything changed? What's changed? How are you guys approaching COVID-19, like this whole situation? Yeah, I mean, I think like so many organizations that are, you know, are intact, I want to I wanna honor that like a lot of organizations are struggling and some have already closed their doors, but um, it's, it's in some ways, it's like everything changed in other ways, like not, I don't want to say nothing changed, but like I'm, I'm really proud. It's this idea, you know, we, our character is tested in, in, our, in, in challenging times, right? I think individually and also organizationally. And what I'm seeing is this character that I've believed in, that I've, that I've bought into at Culture Amp, that I want to be part of and that I'm contributing to is holding. So I think that's when I say nothing's changed. Like it's so nice to see how it's showing up in these times. So what has changed? I mean, I will say that we has like everybody else has snapped completely into full, full, fully distributed t- team. So we've had to look at how are we, how are we coming together? How are we connecting? Um, you know, and so that's different sort of like the way we're working. We're like looking at, um, we, you know, I play poker with colleagues you know, every couple of weeks online. We do these connection events that we call a culture on cork that we're hosting virtually now. Um, and what's cool is, the audiences are bigger. It used to be a San Francisco thing. Now it's like, well, why can't our New York office be part or why can't? So in some ways it's fun. We've truly gone remote and not just saying we're remote friendly, but we are all remote having to experience it this way. Um, What else has changed? You know, I think right away we realized that this is not a time to be selling. Um, So, and I was really again impressed with how fast the organization was able to rethink this and stop our focus on new business. And some of that, there's privilege in that, you know, we're lucky that we've gotten to the size we've gotten to that we, we are are funded at the moment. And like, so those, I mean, again, like we have a luxury, but we just really quickly thought to ourselves, what's the right thing? What should we be doing in this time? And I think it's this like servant leadership, right? That right now it's time to serve and like, look at the environment we're in and how can we best serve? You know, as you know, we're building this community. Again, so grateful that we started building this prior because I don't believe now is the time to build a community. Um, You know, it would probably be tricky right now to start from the ground up, but because we had put the foundation in place um, and a community designed for bringing people together to to be human, to connect with one another, yes, talk about workplace issues, but from a human perspective that people are craving it more now and the demand and people are reaching out to be part is is shooting up. So that just tells me that that's another, a a great area. so yeah, rethinking, like just how we're approaching the market. What's, what does our community and the, and the world need right now and not continuing down the path that we were on? Um, I think that's my, 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 what first comes to mind when I think about what's shifted. So right. like I said, you know, it's, it's been like, yes, and some things feel this, like we're still our company intact doing what we've been doing. How do you feel like culture itself has changed at companies? I mean, obviously there's the element of a lot of places going from in-person to all of a sudden 100% remote. Um, but like in terms of like how that's impacted people individually, how it's impacted one-to-one relationships or one-to-team relationships, what kinds of changes have you seen in the culture itself at different companies around? Yeah, the- well, I want to say that I think it's, I still think it's a bit early to, to, to say like definitively what we've seen because I think right now we're still in the trauma of it. So right now, I think there's still the adapting. I'm, I'm sensing right now a little more settling in. Um, so I think the first thing was just the like, oh my God, this happened really fast. And some companies were prepared. Like, you know, we used to joke, like I would joke with other people who'd walk into the office and it's like, at any given, on a good day, it was 50 or 60% of the office was there. And it would be like, really? We have all this office space. Where is everybody? But looking back now, what I realized is that because we were able to like people could work from home or work in the office or work here or travel that we were able to snap into place really quickly because we had that we kind of had the muscle memory built. So right. So where I'm going with that is you're seeing organizations that that's what they're doing. They can have a great product, a great everything is needed, but the organization, it wasn't tooled for this. So like they have to figure out how to retool fast before their company is in trouble, aside from anything about their product or about their um, you know what they're doing. So I think right now we just have to hold space for like the impact and we'll, and each, each organization is going to find its kind of new norm. Um, so I will say then, and then what we're noticing, we're seeing clearly the companies thinking about how do we, how do we do this virtually? How do we, and I, it's not, I, I'm, I'm having a real like knee jerk reaction. When people say work from home as if this is just what it used to be. And we're just working from home now. Like it's not work from home. It's virtual work. It's, it's, it's like, it's not that construct that we had before. So, and what I mean by that is, yeah, before 
you know, I, I had enough interaction with people. So we got on a call and it was a crappy meeting, but whatever, we got together, we got the information across and that was the end of it. But now it's like, no, but how are we connecting online? How are we, how are we getting those other things that you were getting in the hallway or somewhere else that you're not, but we're craving. So I think finding that, but I do want, but I will tell you that I want to address the bigger meta that I see and that I'm partly, I think, predicting and partly starting to sense is that I do think big shifts are going to happen. I do think that we will not go back, even if we want to, especially the longer this goes on for, we will not be able to return to what was. I think that this is, um, this was an event that's really pushing on the fragility of a lot of the structures that we've created that probably have needed to be pushed on. And it's unfortunate it's taking an event like this. And what I mean is, like, how do we organize? Like, I've been always interested in or, like uh, alternative organizational structures where we like really pull out more of the power of all these individuals. And here we are in a time and a place where we're all interconnected. We bring so much to the table and we're still looking to like the leader to tell us where to go, or what to do next. And I think that we're going to walk out with a more distributed uh, thought process around how we can work and how we can self-organize. Um, I think that's been coming. I think this is just a, a forcing mechanism that's going to push us further into that. I think these things around air quotes, soft skills, human connection, that the future of work that we've been talking about is now going to be here in a bigger way. And when the dust settles, everybody's been looking around saying, okay, if, how do we do this differently? So I think we're going to see major shifts in the way we work in our organizations. Um, we'll still have our issues and our problems and it won't be everything fixed overnight, but I, that's what I see coming. Craig, I'm uh, thank you for that. But I'm, so I'm, 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 really curious on give give me something tangible give me a tactical like this shift the the dust settles uh call it whether we're four weeks out six weeks out eight weeks out whatever that time frame is right so the dust is settled give me something uh tangible something tactical that um you know people can start working towards towards that future of work give me give me some of those um touch points please yeah, I think one that comes to mind that a colleague of mine, uh, Damon Klotz, was, was mentioning the other day when we were speaking was, I think we're going to be more intentional about why we come together and how we come together, right? So I think that the, the dust is going to settle and we're going to say, does everybody just need to show up to this place every day because that's what we do? Um, or are we going to rethink, you know, yes, we're going to want to come together as individuals, but do we need to come together just because? Or do we need to come together... For, with more intention. Why are we going to get on a plane to go to that conference? Am I going to hop on a plane and be at a conference 15, 16 times a year just to say I was there to say hi? Or am I going to be more intentional about why, why are we spending that money to send everybody everywhere? And what's the, what's the bigger intention? And can we do this partly virtual? Um, I think that, uh, yeah. So, I mean, if, if that's more tangible. I also imagine yeah, uh, you know, like, like again, why it's kind of like the flipped classroom, you know, when, when we started to say, why can't they come together to work, but get their lesson online? Can I work if I need quiet space to work? Can I do that from home or somewhere remote? And then when I go to the office, so to speak, that is it the traditional office? Is that where I come together where I can just be with my colleagues and it's a different sort of environment when we come together? Why are we coming together? It, you know, again, it was just there to, to fill space and to hold. So I think real estate's going to look different. I think all the space that we've created for offices, we're going to be rethinking. Um, yeah, you know, another another idea that came to mind for me, and I'm, I'm scared I'm not getting as, as tangible as you'd like is, uh, but I'll, I'll go there. Was like I think retail. We're going to rethink retail. So we're going to have a lot more space everywhere. Why do I need to go to work to sit with my colleagues? I mean, I want to go to work and be around other professionals and that energy and that in space. Why couldn't I go online, have my meeting, and then get up and? Um, it, it kind of like co-working, but rethinking co-working. Like I work closer to home in my community at, you know, there's space where I'm around people, we're all working, but I may work for a different company than you, but we're still office mates. So I, I think the way we think about space and coming together is going to be dramatically different. I also think that, you know, managers are having to have to rethink like how we're managing remotely, connecting with individuals, what do touch points look like? How are we communicating? How are we seeing each other? when we when we're not just in these structures that we've had did that answer i don't know if that was if you want more specific let's, let's no, that was, that. thank you thank you for that craig i i, I loved I, I love talking to the theoretical but i also like you know so how do we go from ten thousand to one thousand right what I are some you. things that uh give our listeners something you know to to work towards right like it's it's one thing to have a roadmap, but if you yeah. don't have those uh, steps in place, <laughs> so thank you for that. You're welcome. Well, and, I, and I will say to you, just like we, to the listeners, like always right now, like the truth is I don't have all the answers and holding space for unknown and new beginnings, which 
in itself, I think is a skill set. Like how do we deal with some anxiety of the unknown? How are we supporting each other with that? Because there is so much unknown. I don't have the answers. We're three weeks into this. Um, I sense something big coming, but like, how do we prepare ourselves for change and new beginnings? Um, you know, and just making that be part of the equation. And I think that is right now. So just supporting our organizations around that. Yeah. yeah and I, actually, I think about like the mental health element to all of this, right. Is that, you know, the, from a psychology perspective, there's kind of this, there's so much, um, so much of our communication is nonverbal, right. And uh, all of a sudden we are put in a place where we're counting on our verbal communication, probably more so <laughs> than before, because now we're not getting to feel the presence of someone. We can't really see their entire body react. We can see maybe some of the expressions on their face if they have good lighting on their video camera, um, you know, and so I think that human to human connection piece is also going to be important. And then also how are we supporting the mental health? of folks when you might not be able to pick up on so many subtle cues that are happening that we otherwise would have in a in-person environment. Well, yeah, I think, and that was the point, Craig, you brought up earlier that, you know, that right now, this moment that we're in is the, the grief, the ad adaptation to something that's not just a, not just a, a flyover thing. I mean, this is a true change and we need to embrace that. We need to step back and be empathetic and understand that people, yeah, some people have been working from home and this is sort of normal, but most have not. And most companies have not embraced that. And so this adjustment period is going to be filled with all kinds of opportunities to Nina's point about addressing mental health, um, and I think the the one takeaway from your tangible takeaways is, or the one word anyway, is like intentionality. Like we, because that's the biggest question we're getting, I think is, you know, we need to start thinking about what the new is going to look like when we come out of this. What, what, like, what's the question you're getting that you all are getting the most during this? Hmm. But, uh, let's go back to the mental health thing. I want to talk about that for a minute. I think two things come up for me. One is, we have to tease apart two things. One is the, the trauma of the now, like there's going to be particular uh, mental health issues that just like if there was some tragedy that happened in an office or at a school and they bring, you know, bringing grief counselors and all these sorts of like, we have to deal with the, 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 the impact of how people are just dealing with this here and now, which is unique to the situation. So, you know, maybe bringing in like more coaches, counselors, uh, offering that to your employees, um, having some of your best employees who are great listeners, who have just shown that over the years to like, you know, maybe free up some of their time to, to meet with other employees and talk or share ideas or thoughts or however you can build, bring people together. Um, and, but I, I, I do want to say that as much as we do a lot with the verbal communication and sitting in a space, I'm also being blown away myself included. Cause I had an aversion to all the online stuff, especially for the human. I was building these really human people coming together. And I will tell you one of the gifts for me out of all of this has been, once I got my head around the fact that I had to use a medium that wasn't my preferred medium, and then I got, I got used to it, then I started leaning in to say, well, how can I create what I've been doing other places through it? It blows my mind the power of the connection with intentionality that we can create it online. I think we have to, but, we, but more than ever, we can't rely on just in, innuendo. Like This is going to force people to like up your game with how you communicate. Do you have words for emotions? Can you really check in? Like, if we can do that, and we, start, we can still connect with humans my wife's a therapist she was completely adverse to online prior now all of her her business is, is blowing up and she's online all the time and she's even having these ahas like how much of it was our story that we couldn't do it this way versus the reality and now that we're forced into it i'm just there are these moments of like wow maybe some of that was my story and not necessarily the truth and how do we retool and how do we have to be better at asking better questions and communicating better about our emotions and starting to have a language for that, that, you know, we, we, we hadn't had an, until now. I love that. And I think getting to Mike's question, you, you've kind of brought up two concrete things. One is like, how can companies provide that support, whether it be, you know, coaches, therapists, whatever companies can actually step in and start providing that. Um, but also like helping us come up with a new language. And I think that's actually a really important yeah. thing to help us figure out how do we communicate language-wise these concepts that we might well, have. Well, being the token, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that because being the token blind guy, body language doesn't do much for mm. me. Right. Um, <laughs> <and how> much, <laughs> we just leveled the playing I, field, didn't we? 
Exactly. Uh, you, you kind of level the playing field for, for to me, the, the broader people with disabilities community even, right? Where, um, because so much of the people with disabilities community, mm. uh, quite honestly, there are uh, the biases, whether we want to call them unconscious or not, uh, they come out in body language um, when it's all, when you're all in person. All of a sudden now, uh, we have an opportunity to start leveling that playing field of just let's communicate. Let's start using those words, right, in very intentional ways to get the, the point across, whether it's uh, personal or professional. So, um, so I, I, I love that. And, I, and I'm throw, I want to throw something out to you, especially with your background, Craig. Yeah. Um, so, and please don't take this like this, this is because I'm a social creature. Um, I, 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 I'm a sales guy. I, I like being in and around. I, so whether or not I see the, the body posturing and stuff like that, I can still feel it, right? So there's, there's an energy to, to that. And, and I really do enjoy uh, being around people. However, being blind my entire life. This and I've talked to a lot of you know I'm part of other, a lot of blind visually impaired professionals groups and other professional with disabilities groups talking about this um, as an event and it's a very impactful event and it's impacting people's lives uh, for sure I mean um, but I still uh, don't look at this as being a like it's it's a thing for me I've been blind my entire life so I've learned to deal with. Uh, maybe a certain kind of trauma and you being from the psychology background and being in and around that uh, the people culture being very intentional about that. What is your what's your thoughts around, um, you know, the ability for people to overcome because this is whether it's acute trauma or, or, or chronic trauma, that sort of thing, like it's you can build that resiliency muscle. Uh, regardless of being born blind or in a wheelchair or whatnot. So I'm uh, curious on just your mindset in and around kind of all things trauma. Hmm. I mean, all things trauma. Look, this is a trauma that's impacting a lot of people at one time, but let's be real, like at, a, at an individual, don't we experience like a trauma this big? Like people have come down with diseases that put them in their bed for what's that what, where you kind of get paralyzed or, um, you know, somebody in their family got sick or somebody got in a car accident. Like, trauma is happening i mean i think what's different is here this is mass trauma across uh, the entire planet which right now which has its own unique implications but at an, an n of one an individual trauma is trauma and how do we deal with trauma i think i think we give p space for people to be seen to be able to show up with their truth to be able to bring fear and and i'm scared and um you know maybe you know like uh, sad all the things that come with that like these are real like in some ways, nothing changes. Like we're still humans experiencing this world. We're just experiencing it all collectively right now. So I, you know, I think we still have to lean into the same things that we've always leaned into with around trauma. And that is how do we, how do we support trauma? What's tricky is when everybody's feeling depleted or doesn't have their needs met, it's hard to meet the needs of others. So I think it's worth to keep an eye on if, as we're all dealing with this trauma. I mean, for me, like there's a lot, I've also, look, I know this is all going on and I look around and my family's healthy. We're in an okay spot. I have people around me that I love. I'm so grateful. So I say that by meaning my question to myself is this, 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 the power of privilege. In this case, I have a privilege in this moment where I'm in an okay spot. So what do I do with that? Do I just sit back and say, my family's safe, hunker down? Or do I say, okay, now I have some extra excess. Somebody might not be, how do I connect with, I have a colleague who I have multiple colleagues. They're like alone. They're alone in San Francisco in a small apartment. And now we're going on three weeks like I did a guitar lesson this weekend with somebody like small things and not, this is not like, Oh, look at me. But just if I have, if my, my privilege gives me some extra space, how do I use that um, to support others? And I, I would ask the same of others. And the other thing that came up twice as I was, as you were asking that question, I was thinking and something I've been working on is the shift from a scarcity mindset to abundance. Meaning we, we started that thing with what are we losing, but with this, you know, with the body language and all that, like that's a very real, like that comes up often for me and for others. And then you spoke, Mike, and said, you know, hey, I'm blind. I feel like this is leveling the playing field. Like I've been living, and it's like, oh, what are we gaining? Like what's the abundance? What are we getting here? Like we approach it from what we're losing and then, and then you hear another perspective. You're like, wait a second, I've been feeling good. Like, what about everybody who's gonna be able to go into work? I heard, Mike, tell me if I'm correct. I think I heard, I saw a speaker once, something like, only 20% of visually impaired people that want to work are employed. Like, isn't that awful in today's yeah. day? We have the technology that we have. And maybe something like this all of a sudden opens it up and brings it to 60 or 70 because, uh, you, you know, we rethink things. Or if you're, if you're in a wheelchair, right? So physically space has been an issue, but like why? And now 
So what, I guess my question is also, can we, can we sit with, you know, in this time when there's going to be a lot of tragedy, what are we also getting and what are we gaining? And where's the, the abundant side versus like, what are we losing? What are we getting? And I think, you know, the brain gets scared to, 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 to scarcity, but um, I, you know, urge people what's, what's also, what might we be getting here if you stay open to possibility? Absolutely. I love, yeah, yeah, I, love I love that, that Craig. And, and so I, you know, there are so many, um, whether it's our veterans, you know, with post-traumatic stress and, and you hear again, we, and the reason why I bring that up, because I, I believe that, you know, the, the conversation of, of mental health, and the com, you know, realizing that yeah, there are a lot of people who, quite honestly, are being thrown for a loop in this. And could this be creating? Could this right be creating a global empathy moment? Because all of a sudden now, there's I mean, who who do you know that is not impacted with this? You know, it goes you know six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Everybody is connected to COVID nineteen now. Like everybody yeah. is impacted. Special. So could we be creating this global empathy? movement right now that starts to uh you know on choose inclusion we have three really unique perspectives between you Aldo and Nina and myself and and of course I'm I'm always beating the drama professionals with disabilities because of the dis- disparity within the employment sector within workforce development and yet to me I look at this moment in time where maybe more people will start to be a little bit more empathetic because challenges are just challenges It's never the mindset of what, you know, like one of the first questions that we ask our job seekers who come to Blind Institute of Technology is, is your blindness an obstacle or is it a barrier? Because that mindset is everything when it comes to employment. And right now that mindset, is this an obstacle or is this a barrier, is everything to humanity. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm also, even when I was a little kid, I used to always wonder like, what if like, you know, as a kid, I remember like USSR and the Soviets and this. And I was like, what if an alien came and like it was attacking your whole planet? Would like the whole planet come together? Um, and then and then over these last few years, I started to question. I was like, I don't know. It seems like that's happening. And like, we seem to still not unite. But then this happened. And it made me realize that this is the first time I think I've ever been able to get. I don't, I've gotten on the calls with people around the world over these last few weeks. And it's, it's the weirdest experience that we all shared. It's not like my colleagues that were dealing with their wildfires in Australia a few months back, or when we were dealing with them in Northern California, like there are some big global things. You talk to somebody, there's a flood or, but weird that like we're in a time where every single person everywhere on every phone call is dealing with this. It's like, and I'm with you. I have such high hopes. Like what will this bring? I think my mind goes to, I think there'll be a lot of positivity out of it. I think there's gonna be a lot of change. And I was just having this conversation I also hold space for humans or humans like this will settle. I think we'll see a lot of great change and we're going to see the new opportunistic stuff come up and how will greed show up in a new way and how will, and can that be okay too? Like, can we, can we hold space for the shadow and humans and honor that, but also we're yeah. working towards a better way, but like not creating this ideal that it's, everything's gonna be perfect. I think it's gonna be different. And I think there's gonna be a lot of positive energetic shifts that have been needing to be made for a long time. that have been held in place by power and money that aren't going to hold and we'll begin the new process of humans figuring out how to take advantage of a new system. Unfortunately. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's a great point. Well, I love, I, I, I've loved this conversation. Obviously we could talk about this forever, but um, I think the, 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 the thing that I pulled out of this really was the intentionality, but, but also like reaching in and realizing the skills that we already have and how can we put those to, to really good use to help others in this time of need, right? Like, you know, and, and it, it, it kind of, it goes back to what you were talking about, about that kind of overflow of empathy, right? Like the things in your, your closest empathy circle right now, your family and your friends are, are good. So now how can you expand out and, and, and help others beyond that, just that close uh, circle? Um, that's huge. And it, it, but, it, and I think, I think it is a time for us to start to realize like, what are our strengths and how can we use those to come out of this and, and, yeah. and you know, understand what the opportunities are going to be, what the new normal is going to be. Yeah. And, you know, how do, yeah. How do we come out of this different and better? Yeah. And I know we're wrapping. So I would say that 
when you were talking in our conversation, I mean, I would ask anybody listening to this, take an assessment of right now. Are you, do you have a, you have some excess or are you depleted? Are you sitting alone and alone? And where I go with that is if there's excess, if you feel like you're in a comfortable place, like I'm finding myself, the question to you would be, how can you help somebody that might need a little, you have some extra. And then if somebody that feels depleted, which is okay too, I would say, are you willing to lean in and ask for some help? And that's really hard too. You know, and I think in life, there's times where we need to reach out and ask for support. And there are times where we have some extra. And if we're willing to be honest and say, I have some extra, what am I going to do with the power of my privilege in this moment for whatever reason that is? Um, but if you're on the other side, that's okay too. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with you. We all find ourselves on that side. If you're on that side, can you, can you reach out to somebody that might have some excess? You know, are you willing to do that? Um, I think it is, is, is important. And I also want to, you know, I am, I do represent culture amp too. I, I want to say that culture amp showing up the way we know how um, we did on culturefirst.com, which is all things community for us. We have a, a COVID. We're just collecting all sorts of resources from the, from a, a people operations perspective on managing remote teams. And, and it's not just our stuff. We're pulling together the stuff that we're seeing, like from some of our favorite partners and like life labs and others in, in the world. So we're, it's, it's our way. There's nothing, there's nothing, we're not trying to sell anything through this. We're trying to compile great information. We've heard from a lot of HR leaders that they really are finding a lot of benefit. So if you go to www.culturefirst.com, you can see our uh, resources that we've compiled. Um, and we really, and we're, and we're pushing harder on community again, to bring people together so they can connect in these times when they're, when they're not feeling as connected. So um, I just want to make sure people know about that. Awesome. Now, thank, thank you, you, Craig. Craig. What, uh, what, a, what a true pleasure. Yeah, this was, uh, this was a lot of fun and we appreciate you taking out some time and, and, and talking to us on the Choosing Conclusion podcast. So thank you. I love it. Uh, I hope maybe down the road we can come back. I have all kinds of like other like back to normal topics I want to talk about with all of you around like <laughs> hey, men in the idea. workplace and you know like yeah, all these other issues that need to cover that stuff too and um, I think it'll be an interesting yeah. conversation even a couple months from now as we're in yes. that post learning or learning everything and then pivoting into something new I would love to have you back on the podcast and you know, talk about that. We'll Let learning. me know well, when, but I'm, I'm a big fan. I appreciate all of your all's work. I've gotten to listen to some of the podcasts, so I'm really honored that you, you allowed me to come on and, and share. Uh, I, like I said, I hope it brought value and uh, let's, I just, our partnership both individually and organizationally um, means that we're, we're better together and bringing more to the world. So thank you. Awesome. Thank Fantastic. you, Craig. Thanks team. We really appreciate it. Um, as always, if, if people have questions or um, topic ideas or want to be connected to Craig, we will, or Culture Amp, we'll put all that information out there. So thank you as always for listening and we'll see you guys next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye guys. Thanks for listening to the Choose Inclusion podcast. Make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And you can see closed captioning for this podcast on our YouTube channel. You can find us online on our website, chooseinclusion.com, and contact us on Twitter at chooseinclusion.